this is the uh, August 19th, 2015 segment of AgBase. So today we have uh, two speakers um, uh, who will be discussing about some, uh, some of the experiences uh, or work that they've done in um, two areas. One is weed control in cucurbits and potatoes. Mr. Rodney Walbrown will be uh, sharing with us some of the work that he has been doing in Mason County for the past few years. And the second topic is going to be about the importance of sanitation in uh, integrated pest management. And uh, Dr. Barbara Lydell with the West Virginia State University will be uh, you know, discussing this topic. So uh, with me here at Morgantown, I have uh, Dr. Mahfouz Rahman. And um, I know that today is State Fair Day and um, I mean the State Fair Week and a lot of folks may be uh, in Louisburg this morning. And uh, also Rodney mentioned that there are uh, several National Gardener events going on. So um, obviously uh, we may not have uh, too many people to take I mean, to, uh, uh, for the discussion part of it and you know, to ask questions. But uh, we'll take questions at the end of uh, the formal presentation. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Rodney. Uh, we'll be discussing about weed management in specialty crops. Well, thank you very much, Rakesh. I, I really ap I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be involved in, in this Ag Beats presentation. Uh, as most of you probably know, the announcement has gone out that I plan to retire the end of August. August the 31st will be my last day. I want to say that I have really enjoyed 26 years as a, an extension agent here in Mason County following 17 uh, years of teaching vocational agriculture here. I've always been a an agriculture person grew up on a farm and uh, that's that's what I really enjoy and, and like I say extension there's not a better job in the world than being an extension agent I have really enjoyed working with uh, the extension specialists over my years here uh, everybody from Rockesh and MM and and the back to the Charlie Sparrow and all those guys. You couldn't ask for better folks. I think we've got some real good extension specialists now that that get out and do things, and, and I really appreciate that. Uh, the only thing I would say to other agents that's going to be left in extension after I retire, I really encourage you to do some traditional extension work. Uh, we should never get away from the basics of uh, agriculture. Uh, some of these other things are, are you know, fine and, and we ought to be participating, but the bottom line is basic agriculture, production agriculture. For goodness sakes, don't spend all your time as an agent sitting in your office uh, uh, being on the computer and doodadding around with all that stuff. Get out there and uh, do things that help people uh, and, and not waste a lot of time in things we shouldn't. Uh, something like this today I think is a real good opportunity for us to learn from each other and uh, you know we, we need to take advantage of that. Now Rakesh called me and wanted to know if I'd do some talking about some things that are a little different. Uh, now, sure, here in Mason County, we have corn, we have soybeans, we have alfalfa and hay and all that. But a few years ago, um, I became interested in some things that I kind of refer to as specialty crops. I had a lot of farmers that uh, have some land that they don't, they really don't utilize. I mean, it. it anything from uh, winter feedlots, winter areas that they keep their heifers in or their cows or maybe a group of steers or whatever. And then uh, that ground pretty much lays idle through the summer. And all they do is let the weeds grow and brush hog at a time or two or whatever. And I thought, now that's pretty much of a waste. And with all 
the uh, manure that's in there and all the nutrients and so forth, I thought there's got to be some way that we can uh, kind of capture uh, all those nutrients. And also we think about the water quality and so forth. Uh, with areas like that that might eventually drain into the creeks, we need to do something to capture uh, those nutrients. So one of my uh, more productive farmers, and uh, he kind of listens to some of the things and does things, uh, I asked him about the possibility of taking one of those lots and going into some kind of crop. And, well, his first question was, well, what would we raise? And the first year, actually, we got into uh, pumpkins and squash and uh, okra and all kinds of things just to see what would go. And, uh, and it worked. I mean, there, we got a lot of good production. Now, of course, you've got to also remember through this, you got to look at your food safety plans and all, and you got to worry about this manure. I mean, if you've had a group of cattle in there uh, up till the first of April, maybe before you take them out, then uh, it's a little questionable whether we ought to be going, of course, to uh, food crops such as squash and and watermelons and that because uh, you know that needs to be composted and and all. So always consider that. But anyhow, when we uh, were all said and done, we kind of come up with the idea. We like the uh, the pumpkins and uh, the watermelons. Uh, there are mar and people don't understand and don't really realize the market that's available for pumpkin growers. Now, I mean, I, sometimes we look at that and we smile and you know maybe make fun and and hoorah about raising pumpkins. But I'm going to tell you, there's a tremendous amount of uh, market demand for pumpkins. And if these farmers can raise those with a, a little bit of uh, investment and a little bit of labor investment, it's a tremendous crop. Now, to make raw cash happy, though, uh, when you look at uh, pumpkins and when you look at raising pumpkins, uh, in conditions, maybe winter feedlots or some of these lands that haven't been cropped the previous year in corn and soybeans and a good weed control. Let me tell you what, you've never experienced weed control pressure, weed uh, competition like you'll get from a, a, a place that's had cattle all winter. Uh, I mean, it, it is, it, it's amazing the amount of weeds that will appear. And if you're going to uh, a pumpkin crop in one of those fields, uh, you better be ready to go. And uh, I, uh, I would very much discourage somebody from going in those kind of fields if they're not willing to use some type of herbicide along with maybe some other management things such as cultivation or whatever. Uh, but we wanted to utilize that and, and we did. Now, kind of new to all of us, kind of new to all of us. Um, when you go to looking for herbicides, now most of us, and Rakesh included, you know, when you talk to, about raising corn and soybeans and that kind of stuff, it's not too complicated to know by experience or whatever what herbicides work. But whenever you get into something new such as pumpkins or watermelons or some of those, uh, it's kind of a new ball game for all of us. And uh, you can go, you can go what you want. Now, Rakesh is showing some films there. This, this field right here that's on the screen right now is a heifer lot that uh, my farmer uses in the winter. Uh, keeps several head of cattle in there. And up to the right of this screen, there is an inline bunk feeder. Uh, and, uh, you know, you'll have uh, 80 or 90 head of heifers lined up there. And, of course, this entire field has a great deal of uh, manure all over it. Now, if you look here on the, r the left side of the screen, you'll see those uh, giant ragweeds that are higher than a man's head. 
you'll see along the edge of this uh, field uh, red root pigweed and spiny pigweed. Now here's the thing folks, if if it wasn't for a herbicide program and some course uh, cultivation, the middle of this screen where the pumpkins are would look exactly like the opposite side of the fence. And uh, there's no doubt in it because I was down there the other day now, and the, the, uh, up along the, the manger, uh, red root pigweed, spiny pigweed, lamb's quarter, all that kind of stuff was so thick you couldn't get through it and uh, they brush hogged it and I mean it was uh, probably five feet tall and, and that's what you would have over this entire field. Now in, and here again red root pigweed it comes so beautiful right down the rows. I mean you have got to either have a tremendous cultivation or you've got to have some herbicides. Now truthfully uh, when we started this we didn't have a good handle on what herbicides would do the job. Uh, with Rock Cash help, we uh, we came up with this program, and we found that some of these. Now, as we all know, you do not go off label. You gotta go on label. You gotta. It can that herbicide be used on a particular crop? Uh, how do you use it? What rates? All that's very important, and all of us that have been in, in extension should know that and, and follow that. But even though, okay, for example, in this, if this herbicide you said that it controls spiny pigweed, that's a proof right there. It does not. So you've got to, and, and the point I'm trying to make is uh, agents, uh, specialists, there's nothing like good research work. Reading a label, in my opinion, is not enough. Uh, you've got to have tried it in your area. I don't like to make uh, recommendations to my growers or my producers without knowing whether it'll work or not. Now look, we're talking thousands of dollars uh, on these farmers and producers. And if as a county extension agent, all I do is read a label and say, oh yeah, you can use this on corn or this on pumpkins. Uh, that's not enough for me. I, I like to do these research projects and, and then I can look back and say, by golly, this does not work and I don't care what the label says. I don't want to recommend it. Uh, when you get into these specialty crops, now of course here's some tobacco. Uh, there's always, as we've said, uh, the the idea of cultivation. Now let me say this while we're on this picture. My thought is this. If you put a crop out and you put a pre-emergence herbicide on it, two things I, I encourage you to remember. If you get out in that crop later on and you see a lot of weeds coming, in my opinion, there's no need to stand there and say, oh, it'll probably kill those weeds in a few days or next week. If you've got a break, you better, you better start thinking what you're going to do. Uh, the other point I want to make is, if you've got a good weed control in your crop, then I certainly discourage my producer from going in and cultivating just for the sake of cultivating. When you break that soil, when you when you break that uh, pre-emergence uh, herbicide, uh, you're gonna it, you're gonna lose a lot of that. So if it's working, leave it alone. If it's not working, do something. Now in this particular field of tobacco, that was one of those deals that people kind of like to to you know just cultivate and, and all and all that. But remember, folks, in this uh, in this specialty crop thing, and especially using some of these fields that haven't had a, a good uh, row crop on them the year before or a good hay crop, you're looking at spiny pigweed, red root pigweed, jimson weed, cockleburr, prickly seda, goose grass, crab grass, Johnson grass, nut sedge, eastern black nightshade. I mean, you've got some weeds that you haven't dealt with before uh, uh, through corn production or through. So you better be ready. I mean, you need to, 
to know what's going on. And because look, when people call you as an extension agent, they don't want an answer next week. They want an answer right now. And here's the thing that that I've found. Now hold up on that one a minute, Rockcase. I'll get to potatoes okay. in a second. Okay. But here's the thing: when we're talking about herbicides, now honestly, most of us as county agents, we have we okay. just we just don't deal with herbicides enough to be real effective, and we shouldn't be. I have no desire to know about all herbicides and know everything about it. That's why I read labels. That's why I call rock ash and all that. I would never say. Now, for example, made a mistake myself. Very, and and I'll say that since I'm going to retire. Uh, we were talking about raising a few uh, sweet potatoes. Found out that Valor V A L O R can be used on sweet potatoes. So what do I do? I find some Valor, and I sprayed my uh, piece of ground for sweet potatoes. The only problem is I use Valor EXT. I'm right in the rock ash EXT. I think either that or I think Valor yeah. Excel. And, and here's the thing folks, just because it says Valor, those extra letters mean something. Valor EXT cannot be used on sweet potatoes. And after I sprayed it, there's no taking it back. So that lands out for this year. Can't do it. So don't just think about, oh, I can use, you know, dual or whatever. If it's got another name with that, then you got to look at that label. So be very careful. And, and sometimes we mess up and we, we could tell our clients something wrong. Um, you better apply it like the label says. If it tells you to use, whatever the herbicide is, if it tells you to use a non-ionic surfactant, do it. They don't put that on the label just to look good. If they tell you to use some kind of an adjutant with it, do it because uh, it, it serves a purpose. Uh, it might not be very effective without that, so be sure you follow it to the T. We've found here that with pumpkins, uh, strategy is a good herbicide. Command and cubrit are both good, and of course, strategy is a combination of command and cubrit. Uh, we've huh? used sandia. Uh, I, I, to me, the, the jury's still kind of out on sandia. Uh, I've used it. I kind of like it. Now listen, there's a big difference between going in a winter feeding lot and going in a place that's following a good row crop. Uh, things that will work out here following good corn production or soybean production, you might use some of these and just be thrilled to death. But when you get in those winter feeding lots, now as I said, they're a tremendous challenge. So uh, that really tells you whether that thing's going to work. So just because it doesn't work in a winter feeding lot doesn't mean that it would be very effective if you were following a hay crop or a corn crop or whatever. Now, for goodness sake, folks, don't ever forget a herbicide called POST, P-O-A-S-T. POST will kill grasses and not kill uh, legumes and broadleaf. And, and that is your salvation. Uh, if, you're, if you've got a, a pumpkin crop out there or a, a watermelons or potatoes or whatever it might be, um, you know, you may be able to control the broadleaf. Uh, we use a lot on, uh, on our, uh, some of our crops, this Matula Chlor, uh, and it's great. But sometimes this grass becomes a problem on down the road later. And, and for goodness sakes, think of post to come back in these crops and knock that Johnson grass out that comes in, knock out that Bermuda grass that's coming, knock out those barnyards and foxtails and all that. Now, Rockcase, he just has to show this daggone slide where we've had an awful problem. Nutsedge, nutsedge. Uh, nutsedge is not a grass. 
uh, I think botanically it is a broadleaf, it's a sedge, and it is a booger in potatoes and other things. Uh, the Matula Chlor is labeled and should help that. But remember, folks, a lot of times the, the effectiveness of these herbicides, even though you have used the, right, the correct rate, you've sprayed it the way it said, you've used the surfactants or whatever, weather still is a, a, is a, a determining factor. Uh, some of our, okay, let me, let me jump on to the potatoes. Potatoes, we've got about 80 acres of potatoes in uh, the Guyan uh, Conservation District in the Western. Uh, it's a new uh, pilot project that the Commissioner of Agriculture, the West Virginia Department of Agriculture, has started. Uh, I have been very involved in it. My farmers have been very involved. Uh, I did a lot of work talking with Rakesh and different folks, and we came up with a herbicide program for our potato project. We're using Matula Chlor and Prowl H2O. Uh, we last year on some potato work, we used Matula Chlor and uh, Metribucin. But we found out, now Metribution is, it, is what we call Syncor. I like that. But the only thing is, when you read that Syncor label real closely, you find out that it could be detrimental to red, some varieties of red potatoes, and even some varieties of white potatoes. So we were a little... Uh, leery of using it this year, so we went to the Prowl H2O. Works good. Uh, Matula Chlor and the Prowl H2O. But back to what I said. In the fields that we sprayed, when we planted the potatoes, put it on as a pre-emergent, got some rain uh, in a timely manner, we had tremendous, beautiful weed control. But in places, we had some potatoes that only got about two-tenths of an inch of rain in the first probably six weeks they were planted. Uh, and here's what you're seeing. You're seeing some nut sedge come in, and uh, for all practical purposes after that nut sedge comes in, there's not much. Now, of course, there's some horse nettle. Those are the couple things. Uh, Jimson weed uh, had a little break in one of her fields. Now, I'm not too concerned about things like that, uh, but what does concern me with nut sedge, with Johnson grass, and with Bermuda grass, those are all underground rhizome crops, and they'll grow right through a potato. And that is really, that is really uh, uh, damaging to your potato crop. Rakesh flipped back to that one potato field uh, there. Now that's a seven acre field of potatoes up at, at uh, the Lakin State Hospital or the Department of Ag. That is a private owned crop that is uh, leased from this, uh, the Lakin farm. There are five different growers that own and they have their own particular locations in that field, but there's seven acres of uh, privately owned and as pretty a crop of potatoes that you ever looked at. Uh, later on, though, there was some Johnson grass that appeared here and there, and we went back and used post to clean that up. So uh, remember, you need the rainfall and all that. And, and look, the potato, the potato project, uh, I think is a very useful thing. We'll, we'll be harvesting uh, starting probably the last of August. We'll probably be using, where our recommendation is to use a defoliant uh, on the potatoes to kill the vines and to kill any vegetation that, that might be in there. Uh, don't also, don't forget uh, uh, glyphosate Roundup, uh, generic Roundup is is very important to me in a herbicide program. Now, sure, you can't go in there and spray Johnson grass in potatoes with Roundup, 
they're not Roundup ready, so you can't do it. But uh, if you plow a field and disk it, or you go in and disk up a field and, and kind of plan to use a, a crop, uh, maybe a sod seeding, and uh, and after you're plowing and disking, you realize there's some green here and there, that green here and there is going to become a weed. So uh, with the price of glyphosate, you're better off to go in, and even though you've plowed and disked, you might spray over top of that. And, and get a kill on uh, you know those weeds. Uh, if you've got a, 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 pl a planting of pumpkins, you've direct seeded them, and they're not up. And uh, and you look at uh, Rock has showed a screen there a while ago in one of our fields had little seedlings. If you have already direct seeded those pumpkins. And, and then in a few days before the pumpkins emerge, you go in and the, and the weeds are everywhere. Little, okay, look here on this screen. If you look right there between those two leaves, there's a little red or spiny pigweed. Now, I can't go in there now and spray Roundup because I've got pumpkins. But if the, if the pumpkins have not grown out, have not come through the ground, then I could go in and, and spray that field with Roundup and, and kill all those little seedlings that are there. So you got to think. You've got you to gotta just look at what, but again, I, let me encourage you, uh, be careful about just reading labels. You better be sure you understand what that's talking about because some of these herbicides that you'll use in these specialty crops It'll tell you that you can use them in direct seeded, but you can't spray them over the the exact row. They have to go between the rows. So all that's very important. And if you go in and say, oh, I can use this on pumpkins that were direct seeded and broadcast spray it, then you might be messed up because when your, when your uh, pumpkin seedlings start coming through the ground, you'll find them dying back. And the reason is uh, that herbicide wasn't made to spray over top of the row. So look at all that kind of stuff. And, and don't ever think that you get so smart you don't need to call Rakesh or some of those guys because you will. But uh, a lot of things, uh, it, there's a lot of opportunities in West Virginia agriculture. As I said, I'm going to retire from extension. I'm not going to retire from living or being involved in agriculture or working with people. But uh, uh, we in extension have got a tremendous field ahead of us. We've got great opportunity. We've got people like this young man right here, uh, Dan Fogelsong, who is uh, – a tremendous farmer. He does a lot of things, uh, and he's put up with me for several years, uh, asking him to do some things. Rock Cash has put a lot of mileage in down there, but guys like this who want help, who need help, and uh, as extension, it's more important for us to be out there working with those people than sitting in the office and making a real pretty P and T file or or uh, making the most beautiful uh, uh, PowerPoints in the world or all that kind of stuff. Let's stay on the basics of extension and the basics of agriculture and let's feed this country and let's earn our tax dollar that uh, pays our salary. Rakesh, I've said enough. If there's any questions, I would be more than happy to try to answer them. That's great, though. I mean, I think uh, you know you sort of put uh, you know everything uh, in a nutshell, and uh, there's a good perspective of uh, you know the things that you do there, um, all the applied work to you know assist with uh, the producers you have there, answer their day-to-day -day questions, etc. Rakesh, oh. let me let me say one more thing. I've noticed sure. over the years. I've noticed over the years when we're talking about herbicides. Uh, now, look, herbicides, as most of you know, they're pretty expensive, and and a lot of times, when uh, when you as a county agent, when you're talking with a producer, 
and and you you know they they ask you about what can I use and so forth and you tell them even though you know it's a great herbicide when they call and get a price on it uh, they get real squeamish you know they oh my when you're talking three to four hundred dollars for a two and a half gallon jug of a particular herbicide, they just, I mean, they almost come unglued and they just decide, no, I don't want that. Now, look, I can understand if you're a, a homeowner and you got a small field, you got to buy two and a half gallon and all that, but if you're a farmer and you're serious about it, uh, don't, don't let that price affect you too much. Be sure it's economical. Be sure that you're getting the best price you can. But uh, really, it would be nothing to buy a $300 jug of, of different herbicides. And you'll find it's probably money well spent. Now, that last uh, slide Rakesh showed there of Dan kneeling down, that's another wild idea that we had. That was actually dried beans. That is not soybeans. That's dried beans, uh, pinto beans. And folks, I'm, what I'm telling you is this, it's unlimited what we could be raising in this county or in this state. Uh, uh, we could, we, our imagination is the only thing that limits us. This is actually pinto beans, uh, had pretty good production. There's a good price on them. And, and folks, pinto beans can be handled just like soybeans, I mean, as far as the growing of them, the combining of them, and all that. It, it, it's a, as far as I'm concerned, it's an untouched crop that we certainly need to be looking at. Rodney, uh, you know, and as you and I have often discussed about, you know, planning is key. So uh, if, if what you want to do next year or the year after that, you may have to think about it right now because you want all your tools ready to go your uh, you know fungicide program your insecticide program um, you know what has been uh, grown in that field so whether it is okay to rotate to some of these uh, you know specialty crops based on the rotational restrictions so uh, planning is, is key and uh, with some of these materials Rodney mentioned about you know having to purchase um, high volume two and a half gallon containers etc so it may be prudent to see if there are a group of producers who are interested in growing these you know, crops so that you can you know, pull in some resources and uh, then they will be much more uh, be a will be much more affordable that way. Exactly, Rakesh. And, and look, there's we I don't care how good we are on herbicides and so forth. There's nothing that will take the place of good cultural practices that we've been taught over the last hundred years probably. I mean, if we could follow corn rotations, uh, soybean rotations, and alfalfa rotations and so forth, if we could follow those with pumpkins and watermelons and squash and all this, uh, we, would, we would probably be 75 percent uh, there as far as herbicides. I mean, you know, going after a good clean field with pumpkins, we could probably go in there and use a little strategy or something and be tickled to death. Now, yes, as I said, these these uh, hard managing weed fields, I mean, that's a real challenge. But if we had a good rotation, and as Rockcase says, don't wait around to a week before planting time to start doing your herbicides and all. Get back there in the fall or the winter, plan what you're going to use, get it ordered because a lot of times, look, I'm finding that a lot of these businesses anymore, they don't want to keep that stuff on hand. They pretty much order it and a lot of times they've got to buy a, a skid load of it or a pallet or so many jugs of it just to get one jug. So as Rockcase said, you know, in extension, we could probably do a lot. I'm not saying we manage the order, but if we could say in our county, six guys are raising pumpkins and let them all get together and figure it out, it would make a big difference. Rodney, thank you very much for uh, your, 
you know, insightful presentation, um, your words of wisdom, and sharing your experiences, you know, over all these years with the group. And as you uh, know, this has been recorded. And for the folks who are not being able to uh, tune in today, it will be available for them to to listen to or watch at a later point. Well, thank, and, uh, thank you, well, Rakesh. Thank you, sure. and I will look forward to listening to Barbara's presentation because Barbara's another one of those ladies that have done a lot of work with producers in this area. And uh, I mean, you know, all of us working together, we can we can get something accomplished. Thanks, yep. Rodney. Yep. Th thanks, Rodney, once again, and wish you all the best with your All right. I'll and, continue uh, to listen over. to Barbara. <laughs> all right. Can you see my stuff on the screen? Yes, we, yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, Rodney did a great job of setting up stuff for me on what I want to talk about. Um, I'm particularly interested in um, doing work, whether it in the field, a greenhouse, or a high tunnel, to help lessen the insect disease, weed, any of those pathogen and pest problems in there. Um, and have, and my part of the EIP project is to work on greenhouse and high tunnels, but it works in the field as well. So today I really wanted to kind of talk to get everybody ready and think about what to do at the end of the season. Um, so the, the four big things I'm going to talk about are obviously sanitation, crop rotation, which you've already heard about some, record keeping, and also the idea of food safety. It's something that is really here and now, and we need to get out to the growers. And sanitation and end of season prevention of pests is going to be critical for all of that. So sanitation. Um, is basically going to be any practice that eliminates or reduces pest pathogens in either a structure or in the field. Um, and I'll readily admit that's a picture out of my field several years ago um, in there. And while a lot of people think of sanitation at the end of the year, um, it's really something that needs to be done before the growing season, during, and after. Um, Rodney gave you some really great examples, the one about controlling the nut sedge because um, it's a difficult weed to get out of the field, but it can also cause, especially in the case he gave of potatoes, really major problems in there. So um, trying to deal with the problems throughout the whole season. I think a lot of people get really excited, get everything cleaned and ready in, to go into the field or into the high tunnel in there, and then they'll kind of do it during the season, but then at the end it kind of all wanes out. And to be able to go back in the next year it's, or next season, it's really critical to have cleaned up and taken care of it so you don't create problems for you again, for yourself again. Um, some basic examples for sanitation are the easy ones, you know, removing the infected plants in there or the leaves or debris, and that includes weeds. And so, um, being able to follow Rodney's one of ex showing the weed examples was great. Um, people forget about getting rid of weeds inside either a greenhouse, um, especially if it has a floor, but weeds can prop, crop up in there. Um, so getting rid of that so that you don't have it, it can attract not only diseases, but also pests, and so it just adds to problems. Um, often you'll see, you know, plowing or chopping, um, putting basically your infected material under, you know, putting it back into the ground if you're in a field or a greenhouse. The only caveat to that is some of these can be soil-borne diseases, um, can actually cause some problems. And I got a slide in a minute to give some examples of where um, just going willy-nilly and putting that under, you may have some long-term issues that you're going to have to deal with based on uh, looking then at your crop rotations. Um, we have some problems in one field that uh, Mafus was helpful in us identifying um, that we really run into problems growing anything in the Curbitaceae right now. Um, disinfecting tools and equipment, um, not just at the end of the year, but that's a really good time to do it, get it all repaired and whatnot, but to disinfect it 
especially if you have different fields and you're going from one to another so that you don't actually contaminate. If there's anything that's soil borne, you're not bringing it over. Um, any equipment that ha might have pests on it, that you're not bringing it over in there. We actually are do have both field work and greenhouse work. And our rule of thumb is always you do the greenhouse work first before you go out and do anything in the field. If you've worked in the field, you don't go back in the greenhouse. You might pull, take something in on your shoes or on your clothing in there. So we always try and work with the cleanest area we're in first and then go to the dirtiest in there. If we had to go back in the greenhouse, there was no other way. It would be a go home, get cleaned up, change your clothes, come back. Um, in there, and that has really helped us with breaking um, some of the possible transfer from one site to another. Um, talk about brushing particles off. We also use foot baths in our greenhouses, so that you have to walk through those before you walk in. Um, but that's a small amount uh, to take care of. Um, you still have things on your clothes. Um, Paul Mock up in the Eastern Panhandle called me last fall, winter. He had uh, gotten tobacco mosaic virus, TMV, in his one of his tomato greenhouses and had called Penn State and Penn State told him he'd never be able to grow tomatoes in there again. Now, we have gotten his house cleaned. He grew them successfully in there this year, including lines that are not TMV resistant. Um, so it can be done, um, but he is now religious on uh, making sure his workers uh, do not use tobacco products if they work in that house. And uh, here's why. Here's a couple of examples. These are some uh, diseases and viruses that actually you can um, transfer on either seeds, weeds, etc. TMV for tomatoes in particular is um, very easy. They talk about hands and tools here. You can actually have walked through smoke that has TMV particles, have it on your clothing, rub up against a, a susceptible tomato plant and transfer the virus. It's that simple. Uh, so one of the things in terms of sanitation is he took all the stuff out of the house, cleaned all of it with a two-stage disinfection system, and he follows up. All of his tools are routinely cleaned with um, a saturated solution of TSP in there. So, But there's other things like having clean seed with squash mosaic virus and um, pepper mild model virus in there, they talk about getting plant debris out with bacterial spot. And these are just a couple to be aware of. You can't just plow under. If you got bacterial spot out there in your field, you could just have created a real problem if you think uh, you're going to go back in there again. So Rodney also talked about um, crop rotation in there. And I think all of us that do extension and outreach can't say crop rotation enough. Um, it's not only to help break the pest and disease cycles in there and reduce that inoculum in there, but there's some really good things. We need to be looking at maintaining that organic matter in the soil, make sure our nutrients are staying at proper levels, and help keep good biological activity down there in the soil. And we can do that by planning not only what crops go in there, what cover crops are on there, and um, taking you know note of what what else is in there. Um, the other one with cover crops, you know, can also help suppress some of those weed populations in there and reduce some of the problems that you've got. So. Again, it's something we talk a lot about. I'm not sure that we always go through with it and have a plan in there. So the other one I'd go with this is the whole idea of record keeping. Um, having a map of your field or structure in there and not only list what crops you had and whatever cover crops you have in there, 
but also make notes of any of those pests or pathogens. Um, again, Rodney's suggestions about looking at the weeds that are out there, making note of something new that's coming in so that you know that you need to go back into a field or part of that field to start controlling that and have a plan to do it over the course of the year. We used to have a really bad uh, yellow nut sedge problem in our small field. And it took us about four years to get it under control. And it was spraying with a pretty nasty herbicide on the off season, but it took several years to get it out um, in there. But knowing what you have as weeds, having a plan for the next year on what to kill it with. So all of you know Rodney's stuff was just music to my ears to see that in there. It also having notes of what insects you've had in there and note if any of those are overwintering insects, if there's any way you can um, either disrupt their cycle or um, make plans to not grow anything in there that will give them food uh, for the next season. Um, and also be careful about the soil-borne diseases and have a plan to get rid of them. So again, the reason to contact the specialists and talk with them about specific incidents. Um, we have a lot of people that like to save their seed and while I'm very supportive of that, it's really important that we make sure that they hear it needs to be pathogen free. They shouldn't be harvesting um, fruit or seed off of a plant to save for the next season if it's got any um, problems, insect diseases, doesn't look good. Um, they really need to get the story on how to select what they're going to save as well as how to save that seed in there. Um, and again, the cleaning of equipment and tools so that you're not transferring it one to the other. I think having that record and having the crop rotation planned out, you can make then good plans about how you move and how you work within the fields out there. Um, um, and I know I've been singing to the choir, but um, the last one I just want to kind of hit on is the whole idea of food safety. Um, everybody's heard about Gip Gap and writing a food safety plan, and I think, and I've been out there and public, publicly stated it and still will, I think it's really critical that we um, work with Department of Ag um, to get our farmers to rut, to get GIPGAP certified because I think it's m the majority of it is common sense. If they have it, it has the ability to help them lessen their liabilities. They can talk to their insurance agent and it's going to open up markets for them that they don't have already. Um, it also just helps um, back up all of the other things we've been saying all along on good production practices in there. So we also have FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, that's coming into play this October. We don't know what the actual rules are going to be, uh, but have some ideas based on what they've put out there for us to comment on in the past. It's going to be add-ons to what is currently um, in recommendations with GIP-GAP on there. So things that are going to be important when people go out um, and harvest in their fields, the important thing is that when they're picking for going into harvest bins, that they only pick the healthy produce. If they're, they should remove the culls and any infected plant, um, plant fruit, seeds, etc. But they shouldn't be put in the harvest bins. They should be kept separate. That'll help lessen problems with what you're selling, and it'll also get it out of the field. Really bothers me when I see people just leave the culls in the field. That just is a place for more pathogens, pests, etc., to arise from. Again, cleaning the harvest tools and bins. I think at the end of the season, it's really easy for us to forget that that all needs to be done before it gets put away before the end of the year um, with it. 
Then, of course, as you heard Rodney talk about, you know, safe use of manure and the handling of it. That's key when you write a food safety plan in there. Um, also, having safe access to water and making the water sure the water source is going to continue to be safe from any runoff from the farm, um, not just manure, but from anything from the fields, et cetera. Barriers to animals, um, that's um, going to be a tough one, but we need to make sure we don't have not only the domesticated, but also the wild animals in the field. Generally, they recommend that you go out the day before you're going to harvest out of a field, walk the field if you see any signs that there have been animals out in there, cordon that section off for it not to be harvested um, so that there is no possibility of um, contamination from them onto the food. Um, and then finally, the whole thing with worker hygiene uh, needs to be stressed throughout the year. Um, Paul, as I mentioned with the TMV issue, now can't have anybody work in that house at any point of the year that uses tobacco products. Not just smokes it, but um, chews it, etc. Uh, so he has to be vigilant on it year round, even when he's cleaning the house out in there. So um, just kind of in the wrap up for the end of the year on there. Nothing, uh, nothing you guys haven't already heard. And just in case, there's a couple of um, good, good uh, suggestions here of some resources. If you're interested in anything else, let me know. If you're interested in anything, particularly in uh, greenhouse, we actually do have a couple of chemicals. And one series that I use in our greenhouse when we we break the disease cycle every year by pulling everything out of the house and cleaning it top to bottom in there. And that has reduced my insect and disease load in the house tremendously. Um, swear by it now. I will actually buy the products myself to help make sure um, the next year is going to be clean for us to start with. Thanks, Barbara, I, for, for that. Yeah. Uh, did you happen? Sorry, did I interrupt you? No, no, no. So I was okay. going to turn it over to you. OK. Uh, but thanks once again for uh, you know that thorough and useful presentation. I think you covered a lot of uh, new information. Although you may feel that it is redundant, but uh, there are, in fact, a few things that we picked it up at this end uh, that was new to us. So uh, thanks once again for, uh, for that presentation. So uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I'll turn it. Uh, oh, I mean, uh, opened up for questions and discussion. So we have about five minutes more, um, and uh, again we have uh, Rodney War Brown and uh, Barbara Ladle uh, from uh, Mason County and um, and West Virginia State University uh, calling in, and also at Mo in Morgantown uh, we have Doctors uh, Daniel Frank and Mahfuz Rahman. To answer any question, so it uh, looks like uh, I know we have Chuck uh, Talbot, uh, Karen Cox, and Mary Beth um, who, were, who were able to tune in this morning. Do you guys have any questions uh, based on what we heard so far? This is Chuck. Uh, I do. Uh, first of all, uh, this has been very informative. Uh, both sessions for me. I've got a case of. Uh, Nuts edge and and uh, and pigweed in my my uh, annual crop fields and I try to go back uh, as soon as the fields are done and plant an annual that out competes uh, the weeds and and have, have had uh, various degrees of success with that. Um, I use sorghum Sudan grass and uh, it's done a good job, particularly with the Jensen weed and and pigweed uh, and hopefully smothering it out. I, I have cases still, but uh, I, I let a, a field go this year. Uh, it started to come back up, and I thought it was uh, some oh, some annuals, and uh, and it was uh, uh, sedge, the nut sedge, and uh, so I I bush hogged it and planned to go back with uh, you know barley uh, soon. But am, am I uh, am I fighting a losing battle with the the nettle? 
You mean with the nuts edge? Yeah, I mean with the. Yeah, uh, I mean, as Barbara alluded to, you know, in uh, her uh, presentation, see yellow nuts edge, it's a perennial weed, and as you know, they come back from the tubers that are yeah. uh, in the ground. So, um, and you mentioned about uh, growing a smother crop, which will, uh, you know, shade it out and outcompete it. So that is one cultural option, but it's not, uh, as Barbara mentioned, you know, the uh, it may take a few years of sequential treatment with herbicides to make sure that all those uh, tubers are depleted. So they'll, you know, you may get most of it the first year, and then you need to do a repeat application when you have regrowth the following year uh, for three to four years, depending on how established they are. So uh, you need to use a systemic, if you're looking at chemical controls, Chuck, you need to use the systemic herbicide. So a Roundup or any glyphosate product is non-selective. It will kill everything um, that uh, that uh, it comes into contact with. Uh, but for certain crops, um, including, you know, grasses um, and corn uh, and some of the vegetables, there's a product called um, Sandia, okay, which has uh, an active ingredient, halo sulfuron. Uh, so there may be other, uh, you know, uh, pro uh, pro uh, product names, permit is another product. So that can selectively control nuts edge. Um, it may, be, may have to be applied two or three times a year, uh, but if, again, uh, make sure that uh, it's safe to be applied on the crops that you have, that you're planning to grow. So yeah, so we don't have too many options to control nuts edge. Just have to, you know, be aggressive about uh, trying to eradicate, you know, on the area that uh, that that you are managing, Chuck. Thank you. Sure. Daniel or Mosfo, do you have to add anything to the discussion? Or uh, I just wanted to make one point with uh, Barbara's presentation that, of course, uh, we know seed, seeds can bring many disease organisms, especially <laughs> many bacterial pathogens and virus pathogens. So um, I just wanted to make uh, a point that actually by treating seeds, especially those who collect seeds from their own uh, production field, uh, probably there is an easy way like hot water treatment of seeds. Uh, if it can be done uh, safely, we can actually eradicate many of these uh, seed borne problems. Definitely, but you have to be careful when you do the hot water and for which and crop. timing, yeah. Yep, yep. But definitely. Uh, I, uh, go ahead, Jeff. I had, a, I had an issue with the uh, with our, our high tunnel uh, with the, the soil safety, and we one of the high tunnels was a a uh, kitty litter box uh, last December and we decided to abandon the beds and just went to containers in the school but we covered the uh, all the beds with black plastic and it's it's uh, it's been covered now for about eight months nine months and uh, uh, can you comment on that in terms of sterilization I think that it's certainly gone through a heating process and and uh, I feel that uh, we're ready to go back in there once we, we remove the black plastic. Any comments on that? Barbara, I, you I probably think can go ahead. Okay. Have to probably go in, we'd probably have to go and check, Chuck, but you did the best you could. Right. Well, I, I think... Chuck? Chuck. Yeah. What was the problem? Just you mean the cats uh, uh, using the beds as a litter box? I mean, that yeah, was... yeah, yeah. I came back in December, at Christmas, and and uh, when the doors were open, blew open, and the cats uh, put a hole in the plastic, and uh, it's a real terrible uh, feral cat population, and and. Uh, 
and since then we have, you know, we've we made those amendments and put locks and things on the doors. It's we haven't had any cats in there, but I just, uh, you know, you could see in the squares that the cats have dug down in there, and there were a few turds, you know, visible, and and so we just we took out what we saw and then uh, covered it with black plastic, and it certainly went through a heat. Uh, so I, I feel confident that uh, you know it's it's compost now or or sterilized. Mm. Well, thanks for uh, sharing that with us, and um, and um, hopefully you know Sheldon will be here sometime to discuss some of the wildlife <laughs> issues that we have been having. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Add feral cats to his list. All right. All right. <laughs> Just, so, uh, just don't say anything about those cats. That is a politically correct. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know what I know what we'd have done in Roan County when I was a little boy, but we better not go into that. <laughs> All right. So um, looks like we have. Sorry, go ahead. So uh, there are no questions. I think um, time to say. Uh, thank you to the speakers once again, and Rodney, wish you one uh, all the best with your retired life, and we enjoyed working with you over the years. I'll be calling you Rakesh as I need you. I still have your phone number, so don't have <laughs> um, a don't have, don't have your number changed. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> our paths will cross again. It's, you know. I'm sure it will. Thank all of you for all your years of friendship. I appreciate it. Hey, no problem, it. and uh, our colleagues who are not able to join us. Uh, Send their regards also to you and, okay. and best wishes. Thank, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank that. you, Rodney. You all the best. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you, y'all. Thank, thank you, Barbara, too.